Well, good afternoon. The beginning of the academic year is, as we all know, a very special time, filled with great anticipation. We welcome back returning students and embrace a new class of students beginning their collegiate experience. This year's Oxford incoming class, the class of 2019, is the most academically accomplished class in Miami's history. It is also our most ethnically and geographically diverse. We look forward to challenging and certainly being challenged by this class as they become a part of that vibrant learning and discovery environment that defines Miami. This year, in addition to all of the usual energetic efforts across the campuses, as a university, we will explore the common theme of creativity and innovation. Few qualities are as important for individuals and for organizations. Miami is no exception. Creativity, creativity and innovation are deeply embedded in our DNA. From our research, scholarship, and creative expression to our national reputation for pedagogical innovation. So the question before us is how can we be even more creative and more innovative? In keeping this with this theme, um, I want to note that today we're going to have a number of slides. Uh, Debbie Mason, I want to give credit to, has assembled this uh, slides, and she's the master, or as Ted put it, today we have a slideshow narrated by President Hodge. <clears throat> but the point of it is, as when we talk about creativity and innovation, is to recognize that a little light touch now and then, a little humor, can add greatly to releasing our inhibitions and actually being more creative. We set out three goals for this year. First, we aspire to produce more creative and innovative graduates. How can we embed even more creative pedagogical approaches to enhance creativity and innovation throughout the curriculum? What new special programs and spaces would engender creative and innovative thinking? Second, we seek to become an even more creative and innovative university. How can we utilize the innate creativity of our faculty, staff, and students to produce top outcomes? Third, we seek to enhance our reputation nationally and internationally as a university that produces exceptionally creative and innovative graduates. While creativity and innovation have always been important to us, it can be argued that these qualities have never been more important than they are today in a world of rapid change, extensive global reach and competition, and complex challenges. Let me note that I will be using the terms creativity and innovation interchangeably, though there are important distinctions. As Miami professor Jim Friedman describes it, creativity is about generating ideas and innovation is about putting them into action. The rapid pace of change today is a dramatic fact of life. Throughout history, it was logical to expect perhaps continuity or stasis as a norm and change generally being subtle and incremental except for revolutionary periods. But today, rapid change has become the natural state of things. Change is real, it is pervasive, and it is rapid. Much, if not most, of today's rapid change is simulated by or enabled by changes in technology, especially computer technology. In 1965, 50 years ago this year, Gordon Moore postulated that for the next decade or two, as he saw it, the number of transistors on a computer chip would roughly double every two years. Amazingly, this trend has continued virtually until today with now more than a billion transistors on a microprocessor. The increased computing capacity that is reflected in Moore's law has made it possible to analyze, design, share knowledge, collaborate, automate, and yes, even create at astonishing levels, driving change. Of course, for those of us trying to use our smartphones, this rapid change has also increased the occurrence of Murphy's law. As a result, Murphy's law, whatever can go wrong, will. That's my cell phone. Okay, as a result of rapid changes and broad globalization, the challenges we face today are more complicated and more demanding than ever. We face the threat of global pandemics as lethal diseases can spread quickly and without regard to national borders. We're in the middle of a global financial crisis brought on by the slowing economy of China. While we still confront the aftermath of the global recession that badly damaged economies everywhere. We face climate change that is challenging us to understand and to mitigate because of its enormous complexity. As technology turns more and more skilled work into unskilled work, and it becomes easier to find unskilled and semi-skilled labor in other parts of the world, it diminishes the value of routine work and erodes the employment status of many. Yet paradoxically, 
as Malcolm Gladwell points out in Outliers, global demand means that there is a real premium on exceptional and novel work. Those who can create and innovate have enormous potential to tap into a global market or to extend the reach of their efforts with incredible impact, and this is true of almost any field imaginable. In summary, all of this rapid change is both good and bad. Building a world that is more globally connected and filled with opportunity, yet a world in which political, social, economic, and environmental challenges have become enormously more complicated. Thus, it is not surprising that employer surveys consistently identified creativity as the most desirable trait in employees, just above and aligned with critical thinking, effective communication, and the ability to solve complex problems collaboratively, all of which, as we know, are hallmarks of Miami's liberal arts mission. Yet it is a world in which many fear that creativity and innovation are on decline. I will use my address today to encourage our efforts to counter that trend and increase our ability to be creative and innovative. I will first discuss those opportunities, excuse me, I will first discuss opportunities to improve our ability to enhance those qualities in our students, identifying important traits of creative and innovative people, examples of how Miami contributes to them, and suggest how we might improve. I will then explore attributes that make for a creative and innovative organization, noting current examples at Miami and how we might enhance our creative and innovative capacity at the institutional level. So let me start with a very firm assertion. Creativity can be taught and learned. To be sure, there are some people who come by creativity much more naturally than others. But all of us, all of us, including those without the natural gift, can use specific tactics to, tactics to encourage our creative thinking. There are lots of lists of such tactics covering a wide range of fields of general behavior. The first is, these are just tactics that you can use to sort of take on a problem and see it differently. First, identify the underlying assumptions, then imagine what if the opposite were true. Take an assumption, flip it on its head. The five whys. When looking at a problem, ask why something is happening. Then take the answer and ask why that is happening and do a total of five whys. And then there's reverse brainstorming. Instead of asking how to solve a problem, ask how would you cause a problem? You know, flipping these things and, and having a different point of view. And to this list, we should add, take a shower. <laughs> Science has shown that taking a shower produces well, okay, so it's a bath. Uh, science has shown that taking a shower produces a brain chemical reaction that basically pushes aside noise and allows us to think more creatively. Now, like other self-help inventories, the effectiveness of the measures that Glenn provided for us will vary from person to person and certainly with the level of commitment to using them, not unlike the number of times we have to get on the treadmill to see results. And for those of you who wonder what the, what the downstairs of Lewis Place looks like, that was what Lewis Place looks like at 5 a.m. in the morning. Uh, it's not nearly as elegant as the rest of the house, but it certainly uh, is functional. So at Miami, we have a number of places where creativity and innovation are taught directly, including the entrepreneurship program, creative writing, interactive media studies, agile and engineering, and of course, most of the College of Creative Arts. These provide important and often life-changing experiences for students, and we hope to see their number and impact rise. As important and successful as these specific programs are, I would argue that it's even more important to, to focus on developing those personal qualities and capacities that give rise to creativity and innovation, to develop habits of mind that are fertile ground for creative and in in innovative thinking. Not surprisingly, and you will hear this throughout the speech, I believe that these either derive from or align with our approach to a liberal arts education. While there is a long list of the attributes of creative and innovative people, I will focus my remarks today on seven of them. Curiosity, motivation, fearlessness, knowledge, collaboration, persistence, and initiative. For each of these, I will describe how I believe they contribute to creativity and innovation, give examples of what I see as current best practices on campus, and then offer some suggestions or challenges for moving us forward. And I, and I hope you will take all of this in the spirit of provoking more creative conversations and ideas about creativity and innovation. So the first one of these is curiosity. As any parent or grandparent 
can relate, children are born with an innate curiosity. The world is filled with new things to discover, and they are uninhibited in their curiosity with an unlimited capacity for asking why. This wonderful, most wonderful grandchild in the world is Emily Ann Hodge, and she's at the Children's Museum in uh, Denver. So just, this is the way children are wired. Sadly, this curiosity declines significantly as we grow older, even though curiosity is the engine of creativity and innovation. And with the decline in curiosity, we see a significant decline in uh, creativity and other behaviors, such as this one, which demonstrates laughing. Albert Einstein famously declared, I have no special talent. I am only passionately curious. Well, I don't think any of us would agree with Albert on this one, that he has no special talent, but it is a powerful statement of the role of curiosity in shaping his habits of mind. Perhaps even more illuminating are comments of Leonardo da Vinci, whose breadth and depth of creativity and innovation is perhaps unmatched in history. He reflected, I roamed the countryside searching for answers to things I did not understand. Why shells existed on the tops of mountains, along with the imprints of coral and plants and seaweed usually found in the sea. Why the thunder lasts a longer time than that which causes it. How the various circles of water form around the spot which has been struck by a stone. These questions and other strange phenomena engage my thoughts throughout my life. Curiosity. Recognizing the power of curiosity, a central theme of the Top 25 initiative was to promote inquiry-based education. In its simplest form, inquiry-based education is about shifting from a curriculum of topics to be learned to a, a curriculum organized around questions. This changes the student's experience from a passive to an active mindset. As one of our faculty put it, learning is not a spectator sport. Rather, an active, inquiry-driven mindset is all about asking questions and recognizing that the answer to one question is likely the basis for another. It is also an invitation into a world of uncertainty because we assume that some things are unknown. A fine example of inquiry-driven approach is Chemistry 231, where students work in groups, groups to solve a laboratory problem rather than observing an experiment as they simply step through a prescribed uh, template of procedures. The impact of inquiry-driven pedagogy is further enhanced by the interplay with experiential learning. As the ancient proverb puts it, I hear, I forget, I see, I remember, I do, I understand. At Miami, we have been very actively encouraging adopting experiential and project-based learning. The doing of things, especially those experiences and projects that have no right answer, provides a context in which curiosity and hence creativity and imagination and innovation flourish. This approach is especially prevalent among many of our capstone courses and certainly for the students who are with us today from Media and Culture 312 who are doing all of the filming, taping, and broadcasting of today's remarks. So how do we stimulate this environment further? The most obvious answer is to push for even more adoption of inquiry-driven approaches throughout the curriculum and for more and better experiential learning opportunities. We should also continue to expand research opportunities for students with faculty. How better to immerse them in a world of inquiry? A perhaps not so obvious answer is to prepare students for this curiosity-based habit of mind that we seek to create. One of the top 25 initiative faculty asked a very provocative question. When do we tell the students what we expect of them in terms of how they will approach their studies? As you can see, we're not in Kansas. When do we tell them we're not in Kansas anymore? The sooner that the students understand this habit of mind, the more and more deeply they can participate in our vibrant learning and discovery environment. How do we present this expectation as an attractive quality for academically ambitious prospective students? How do we use orientation and convocation to set the tone for them? How do we make our web pages, departmental descriptions, and other publications and websites reinforce, celebrate inquiry and innovation? As we project this habit of mind, we are not only establishing the primacy of creativity, discovery, and innovation, we are also strengthening the underlying motivation for students. And let me turn to that quality next. Marty Neumeyer, in the summer reading book, The 46 Rules of Genius, declared, that passion is the engine of creative genius, a sentiment that is widely shared. 
When a project is seen as a passion rather than a task to be done, creativity or an innovation flourish. This observation reflects the differences in outcome from people who are reacting to intrinsic motivation rather than extrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivations are those that are offered by others. For example, a reward for achieving a specific goal. Intrinsic motivation comes from the passion within a person. Teresa Amabile notes that extrinsically motivated people will take the shortest, most obvious path to the goal line, whereas the desire to do something because you find it deeply satisfying and personally challenging inspires the highest levels of creativity, whether it's in the arts, sciences, or business. Jane McGonigal, whose book Reality is Broken was a summer reading book two years ago, highlights the impact of motivation with a graphic picture of a gamer on the verge of an epic win. The young man projects a sense of urgency, intensive concentration, and a deep focus on tackling a difficult problem. He was experiencing what Czechsent Mihai termed flow, that incredibly positive moment of being completely absorbed in what one is doing. While we cannot realistically expect to see such a vivid expression on our students in our classes, and indeed, I think it would actually be scary to face a class that looked <laughs> full of students like this. Having students absorbed in their work, essentially being intrinsically motivated, can contribute significantly to their learning and love of learning. To create that experience, students respond best when there is a sense of purpose. Millennials tend to want to know why, why what they are studying matters. We also understand from gaming that it is important to have the right level of challenge, avoiding the boredom of a task too easy or the frustration of a task too difficult. Finally, an active task where students are doing something that contributes to a meaningful goal can dramatically increase the possibilities for flow to occur. At Miami, this perhaps happens most often when students are involved in group projects. I love to stop into the meeting rooms at King Library to talk with students. Most of the time, they are diligently working on class projects and, yes, maybe eating some pizza. Are, are they allowed to do that, Jerome? I, I don't know. But occasionally, I will run into a group of students who are really, really into their project. The project is typically open-ended, open interesting, and requires both research and creative thinking. It is a joy to see that they have more or less lost track of time and sometimes view my appearance actually as a distraction. Most often, though, they're eager to share what they are doing. On a more individual level, this moment of flow seems to occur when students transcend the boundaries of a class. As one of our former student trustees put it, she finally understood what Miami and learning are all about. When, while studying one night, she realized that she didn't know what class the material was related to. It was the issue, the idea, and not the class that mattered because it was interesting to her and stimulated her curiosity. She was intrinsically motivated. Our Humanities Center is a great example of encouraging this thinking by creating focal points around themes that transcend classes and draw students into a larger and more engaging intellectual world. So the challenge before us is to seek to create learning environments that encourage intrinsic motivations. How can we create more, more dynamic learning in our curriculum? building on the efforts of Top 25 initiative to create more active classes? How do we embed a sense of purpose into a project or a course? How can we organize learning around questions or goals that challenge our students and stimulate their curiosity? Fearlessness. The act of creativity, by its very nature, pushes people into the unknown and often beyond their comfort levels. Thus, it is not surprising that one of the biggest impediments to creativity is the fear of failure, since radical ideas are often met with skepticism, if not downright hostility. Valerie and I have a cabin in central Washington about 40 miles below the Grand Coulee Dam. It is a magnificent, dramatic landscape. In the 1920s, J. Harlan Bretz proposed a revolutionary explanation that claimed the channel landscape was a result of a series of great floods that occurred when ice dams on the Clark Fork of the Columbia River gave way, unleashing many cubic miles of water from Glacial Lake Missoula. He was roundly criticized. 
ridiculed nationally, actually, in national circles, but time has proven him to be correct. Our cabin is not far from Dry Falls, where scientists um, now believe water flowed over the falls, which are five times in wide and three times as high as Niagara Falls, 300 feet deep at 60 miles an hour for three days. And this occurred, they believe, about three dozen times. So this is, this is what, uh, whoops, point the right way. This is what was postulated. This is what it looks like. Here's the Dry Falls area here. And as you look down, as you go down to the local level, this is the looking down that, uh, looking down the Grand Coulee, and we, our cabin is located about right there. This is another view of, uh, of what part of the Grand Coulee. Uh, it's, a, it's a magnificent area. And then just to show you what it looks like from a local perspective, uh, <laughs> bringing you up close in terms of a focal point here as well. So in addition to sharing a glimpse of our future after retirement, I use this example to illustrate how conventional thinking can actively discourage creativity. As Bretz wrote in 1928, ideas without precedent are generally looked upon with disfavor, and men, sick, are shocked if their conceptions of an orderly world are challenged. But Bretz had the final say. After he received the Geological Society of America's highest award in 1979 at the age of 96, he told his son, all my enemies are dead, so I have no one to gloat over. <laughs> That's not exactly what we want to encourage, but he's, he was well, he was well in his, his due for that one. Well, this is a dramatic example of how external pressures can overtly impact creative thinking. The bigger problem is perhaps the self-limiting inhibitions we impose on ourselves. Professor Jim Friedman describes this as the inner voice of judgment that constantly evaluates what we are doing and actively diminishes our willingness to take risks. Yo-Yo Ma puts this into beautiful perspective. He said, I welcome that first mistake. Then I can get on with the performance and turn off that part of my mind that judges everything. That's a, that's a great quote, I think, about this. Flow is simply not possible if our thoughts are dominated by our critical self. It is not that our critical self is unimportant. It, indeed, it is very important that we eventually bring our critical thinking skills to bear. But as we seek those ideas that will take a leap beyond what we know, understand, or imagine, the critical part of our minds needs to be turned down. Those of us session leaders who participated in the summer reading workshop with Second City were able to see how we can release these inhibitions through the power of using yes hand instead of no but. In what can only be described as a rousing experience, about 100 of us learned to use improvisation to evoke creative thinking and to reduce our inhibitions. I can swear we reduced our inhibitions. <laughs> After, and, and we're sworn to silence, by the way, about what happened there. That's just to be clear about that. After convocation, I observed further the power of yes and thinking in our student session. After walking through the first part of the session with students using an inhibiting no but or yes but logic, where things were very quiet and very dull, the students in my session came alive when we, we, and energized when they shifted to a yes and mentality and were encouraged to take risks. At the same time, it was so important that they knew they had each other's back so that it was safe to do so. Among the many excellent places on campus where students are actively encouraged to take risks, the Institute of Entrepreneurship, ranked 10th in the nation, stands out. One of the features I appreciate about the program is that, and I think it's a real strength, is that while it's logically located in the Farmer School of Business, more than half of its co-majors come from other divisions of the university. A signature program is Startup Weekend, a 54-hour window in which students pitch ideas for startups, gather a team, compose and test a business plan, then present to a panel of judges, and along the way sleep very, very little. The students are highly motivated, surrounded by a safe environment that encourages risk-taking and working collaboratively on a meaningful project. It is demanding, it is grueling, and it is utterly exhilarating. I have also had the privilege of sitting in during a memorable uh, Miami Symphony Orchestra practice. As the orchestra rehearsed, Maestro Averbach would occasionally stop and focus on a particular segment. Much to my surprise, and I must say great delight, some of the students would suggest an alternative way to interpret and play a section. I mean, think about that. The musician telling the maestro that maybe there's another way and a better way to do this. 
This is a marvelous example in my mind of creating an environment that encourages students to take risks. Well, these are great examples of students being encouraged to take risks, stretching themselves, knowing that their ideas may not pan out. I think it is fair to say that most of our educational system works more to discourage experimentation and risk. Grades are intended to motivate students, yet as we discussed earlier, as an extrinsic motivation, they by and large encourage students to take the most direct route to the goal, and that goal tends to be the grade more than the learning. This focus on grades is paradoxically reinforced by the very firms who will suggest that creativity is the most important quality in a new employee, while at the same time setting minimum grade point averages for prospective employees. Thus, the challenge we have is to find a way to hold students accountable and to measure their accomplishments, yet encourage risk-taking and creative thinking. What to measure and how to measure it to achieve these ends is truly one of the most formidable challenges to our assessment. In 1854, Louis Pasteur offered a most fundamental observation. Chance only favors the mind that is prepared. This phrase highlights the fact that most creative insights and innovations do not come from a vacuum. They most often occur because we are able to connect disparate ideas or see a phenomenon with a different point of view. In other words, the more we know, the more likely we are to be creative, assuming that we do not let conventional thinking and our voice of judgment inhibit us. The quality of applying depth and breadth of knowledge to connect seemingly disparate ideas in meaningful ways aligns exceptionally well, I would argue, with the tenets of a liberal education. In a recent artic article, Jamie Holmes captured the importance of knowledge beautifully. The larger the island of knowledge grows, the longer the shoreline, where knowledge meets ignorance, extends. The more we know, the more we ask. Questions don't give way to answers so much as the two proliferate together. Answers breed questions. I love this quote because it unites many of the themes we have already discussed on the importance of knowledge. The deeper and broader the knowledge we have, the more capability we have to experience that spark of inspiration, that moment of connection, and that deeper insight that propels us forward. Steve Jobs understood that concept of knowledge breadth exceptionally well. When introducing the iPad 2 in 2011, he observed, it's in Apple's DNA that technology alone is not enough. It's technology married with liberal arts, married with the humanities, that yields us the results that make our hearts sing, and I would add, creativity and innovation flourish. At Miami, we encourage this breadth and depth of thinking through the Global Miami Plan. Most significantly, the plan encourages not only broad and deep knowledge, it provides the opportunity for students to see the world through different lenses, setting the stage for creative thinking. It is not only what we know, but how many different ways we know that leads to the most creative thinking and innovative results. We also encourage our students to study abroad, recognizing the transformative effect that such an experience has. A study in 2009 showed that students who have lived abroad were significantly more likely to solve a difficult creativity problem. As described by Joan O'Leary, the experience of another culture endows the traveler with a valuable open-mindedness, making it easier for him or her to realize that a single thing can have multiple meanings. Clearly, our deep commitment to the liberal arts as a foundation for learning and our commitment to studying abroad position us well to stimulate creativity and innovation. <clears throat> How can we improve on what we are already doing? Given the centrality of the Miami plan, the Miami plan courses to a liberal education, are we doing all that we can to make them attractive and relevant to non-majors, recognizing that most of these courses have a dual purpose in serving both majors and non-majors? Could we focus even more on introducing non-majors to the habits of mind that shape a field so that they're even more conscious of deliberately attacking a question from multiple perspectives? Similarly, can we, can we shape the study abroad experience to include more reflection on how cultures tend to think differently? And on campus, can we better engage our international students and our multicultural students 
in our courses as an incredible resource for seeing the world through different perspectives. This is the power of diversity in all its forms. But to reap fully the benefits, we must embrace diversity with enthusiasm and intention. I'd like to briefly touch on three additional qualities that contribute to individual creativity and innovation, collaboration, persistence, and initiative. It stands to reason that if an individual can use a broad knowledge to make novel connections, a group of like-motivated individuals from different backgrounds could do even better. This is why Steve Jobs designed the facilities at Pixar to ensure individuals converged on common spaces, knowing that connections between individuals can lead to new ideas. Groups can also benefit from their combined energy and passion that stimulates thinking and drive, as well as a sense of empathy that adds emotional depth to the experience. At Miami, we stress collaborative learning across the curriculum. However, I believe we could do much more to prepare students to participate more productively in a group. A good starting point is to provide students with guidelines for effective work, effectively working in a group, as those developed by Christina caruba wettstein director of the Ranella Learning Center. Learning to work collaboratively and effectively can have a huge impact on the ability to be more creative and innovative, and are in and of themselves enormously important uh, qualities for a student to have. There is a common misperception that creativity and innovation usually occur as a flash of insight that reveals itself. While flashes of insight are certainly part of the creative process, the reality is that most creative and innovative ideas owe one heck of a lot to plain old hard work. They come as we push through lots of dead ends and failures. They require a high level of commitment, and above all, they require us to be doggedly persistent. As Thomas Edison famously remarked, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. The challenge then is to build on that strong work, et work ethic that is part of the Miami culture by helping our students to understand this process and then to design learning experiences that are not linear. While it may be frustrating for students to experience this type of learning, it is essential to creating and realizing the path of creativity. Finally, let me add a quick note about initiative. This is a habit of mine that derives from an active approach to learning in which the student has a sense of agency. That is, he or she is the driver of learning and discovery and creation and invention. It is about a student seeing and seizing opportunity. It requires a good dose of confidence along with curiosity and once again, a willingness to try without the fear of failing. It is in many ways the ultimate expression of intrinsic motivation. Our challenge is to encourage that mindset through the way we structure the general approaches and specific activities in our courses. These last points underscore an important observation about creating a culture, a culture that actively supports creativity and innovation, namely the need to look at all of these qualities, all of these foundations, as a set of interacting qualities that generate significant synergies. That is what creating a culture is all about. So now let's move to the focus of this discussion to the institutional level. I'll begin again with an emphatic assertion. Miami is already a highly creative and innovative university. From the top 25 initiative to teams responding to strategic priorities task force initiatives to lean teams that can take a challenging process and through creative thinking and collaboration improve outcomes, Miami continues to demonstrate an exceptional capacity for innovative thinking that has placed us ahead of the curve, way ahead of most of the curve in higher education. Not bad. Not bad for a university that is more than 200 years old. But as Jim Collins argues, good, good can be the enemy of great. And so to continue to be great, we need to constantly encourage efforts to help make us even better. To be a university that continues to evolve so as to better serve our mission. We have institutionalized that spirit in transformational goal number one of the Miami 2020 strategic plan, which is ensure vitality and sustainability by building a forward-looking, efficient, and caring culture that stimulates, recognizes, and rewards creativity, entrepreneurial thinking, and exemplary performance. So in that spirit, let me explore four qualities that we can build on to become an even more creative and innovative university. Sense of purpose, commitment to continued improvement, autonomy, and mastery. 
As with the discussion about students, one of the most critical qualities that contributes to creativity and innovation is intrinsic motivation. As Daniel Pink, author of the insightful book Drive, uh, noted, the most deeply motivated people, not to mention those who are most productive and satisfied, hitch their desires to a cause larger than themselves. We hope not quite with those results. This is much more important in modern society, according to Pink, since a smaller and smaller proportion of jobs are routine, what he calls algorithmic, where the task follows set instructions with a single pathway to one conclusion. In contrast, work requiring heuristic tasks, where one has to experiment with possibilities and devise a novel solution, is increasing, now accounting, he believes, for about 70% of job growth. Significantly, Pink argues that carrots and sticks approach to motivation that worked well with algorithmic tasks does not provide adequate motivation for heuristic tasks and actually is more likely to be counterproductive. What does work is to create an institutional culture that provides for autonomy and mastery, which I will discuss further in a, bit, in a moment, and above all, a sense of purpose, which is the ultimate intrinsic motivation. At Miami, we are exceedingly fortunate to have a community of faculty and staff whose commitment to our core mission is deep and sustained. It is clear to anyone who visits our campuses that the people they encounter see themselves as part of a university that is a deep commitment to those we serve. That is certainly visible during move-in day when staff turn out in force to welcome our new students. And when I ask first-year students what they think is different in their experience compared to their high school classmates that they've talked to, particularly over Thanksgiving break, it almost always starts with their connection to faculty, who they see as not only available, but also obviously caring about their growth and success and perform enormous mentoring roles. We have formalized that commitment in our vision statement to provide the best undergraduate experience in the nation, enhanced by superior select graduate programs. And in our unifying strategic goal to promote a vibrant learning and discovery environment that produces extraordinary student and scholarly outcomes. And our mission statement. Miami is deeply committed to student success builds great student and alumni loyalty, and empowers its students, faculty, and staff to become engaged citizens, and I want to emphasize this, who use their knowledge and skills with integrity and compassion to improve the future of our global society. I believe we have the purpose idea right, and there, there is an appropriate pride in everything that we accomplish with our teaching, research, and service. It is important then that we maintain and if possible enhance this sense of purpose as we move forward. If I might make one suggestion, it would be to emphasize more our sense of purpose in terms of the ultimate aim. The immediate goals, they're important and they're right there, are to prepare students and to contribute research and creative expression. But the big question captured in that mission statement is to what end? In my view and in the mission statement, the answer is simple to improve the future of our global society. And to do so will require more creativity and innovation than ever. Now the most critical element in building a culture of creativity and innovation is a commitment to continuous improvement. The belief that we can and must seek to do what we do better. In many ways, this impulse is again part of our DNA. We are always trying to improve our knowledge, our humanity, through our research, and various forms of artistic expression. We have the motivation. The challenge before us is how to advance, how we improve so that the outcomes will continue to get better. In order to provide a broader understanding of and hopefully inspiration for the possibilities before us, I'd like to provide some examples of what I see as the outstanding work that is already being done in academics on campus, on our campuses with respect to improvement in organization, teaching, and research and then offer some suggestions in each that I hope might provoke, again, further thinking and discussion. One of the biggest challenges to any organization is to change its structure. And nowhere is this more true than in universities, where our identities are often tied to a field and a department with a long history. Thus, to take the innovative step of imagining a new structure can be very daunting. Yet, we have made several changes in the past few years that reflect a new understanding 
of how we can approach our academic studies. The new department of biology was born out of two venerable, fine departments, botany and zoology, yet now better reflects how biological sciences have evolved and are approached. The reimagined Department of Media, Journalism, and Film embraces the extraordinary changes that have disrupted those classic fields. The new Department of Global and Intercultural Studies is the result of thinking critically about how six programs could be combined synergistically so that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, while also providing better and more efficient institutional support. The Miami regional campuses are undertaking an incredibly creative endeavor, namely, the reinvention of themselves into a single college with semi-autonomous responsibility for developing its own unique curriculum. Last year at this time, I spoke about the challenges posed by the state's change in emphasis for regional campuses from two-year to four-year degrees. Taking up this challenge, the regional campus community has worked through the many possibilities to lay out a vision that will better serve the students and the region. The difficult but rewarding tasks of creating everything from a new departmental structure to a new governance structure is well underway. Is it exciting to see these new ideas flourish in this very, very special moment of challenge and creativity? As we move forward, I would like to offer three general areas of consideration for continuing this inno innovative trajectory. Excuse me. First, as our fields of study continue to change, I would argue that we need to continue, continually actually, consider alternative structures that better support the future directions of scholarship and teaching. Although I have no specific areas in mind, nationally there is significant movement for such changes, and so we need to keep this question before us. This is probably most true as, exciting, as, as existing fields may give rise to and perhaps be displaced by emerging interdisciplinary approaches. Second, I would urge us to consider how we might better provide intellectual coherence around topics or themes rather than departments. Programs like the pre-med and sustainability co-majors provide a clear, logical, and I would argue innovative coherence around areas of broad interest to students. And we can do the same thing for faculty. Third, building on that general idea of at least semi-virtual units, how can we coalesce common research interests around virtual centers so that we can better facilitate these wonderful collaborations? Miami is nationally known as an innovative leader in undergraduate education. From hosting the Lilly Conference, which I believe is the 35th annual one this year, to faculty learning communities, to joining the first cohort of the new accreditation process with its emphasis on learning outcomes, we look to push innovative thinking about how we can better prepare our students. The most significant push in recent years is the Top 25 initiative. That, as I noted above, embraced the challenge of creating more active, student-centered, and inquiry-driven approaches to our learning environment. We have created the new Office of Research for Undergraduates to champion the vision, marketing, and coordination of research by undergraduates at Miami with research active faculty and staff. Undergraduate participation in research has become a signature component of the Miami experience, and the new office and creative working space in King Library give that identity a big boost. The addition of winter term has also contributed to the broader emphasis on experiential learning greatly expanding opportunities for our students to be and do in different places around the globe. And sometimes the global comes to us. Sociology professor Rodney Coates' seminar on social justice is paired with similar classes in other countries. They have scheduled two joint digital sessions this semester with Russia and Italy for 2 a.m. our time. We can make the technology work for us, but we can't change the rotation of the Earth. Miami has been innovative with graduate education. Two of our most recent PhD programs, Cellular, Molecular, and Structural Biology, and Ecology, Evolution, and Environmental Biology, are based on an interdisciplinary framework. The Master's in Social Work has, was created as a joint degree offered with Wright State University. The Low Residency Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing program is a four-semester course of individualized study <clears throat> designed to help poets, fiction writers, screenwriters, creative nonfiction writers, and hybrid genre writers hone their skill and master their craft. These examples reflect successful innovations and suggest further steps to continue the momentum of creative change. In keeping with those qualities that support creativity and innovation, they stress new techniques for engaging our students in learning, 
adopting new technologies, and providing expanded sets of opportunities to do, to deepen experiential learning. The continued rapid change in technology will create many more opportunities for us to innovate in the future. These examples also reflect seizing the opportunities to reimagine how courses and even programs and departments might be restructured to expand offerings that better fit our student needs. Innovations in the structure and format of programs and program offerings building on our strengths can significantly increase our impact. As I noted earlier, research and creative expression are by their very nature innovative activities as we seek new knowledge and new ways of seeing the world. They also are at the core of our learning and discovery environment that defines our student experience. Thus, innovations in research can have far-reaching effects. Miami's Center for Aquatic and Watershed Sciences, for example, re recently opened a new lab at Lackawack Sanctuary, which is a member of the Global Lake Ecology Network that leads to the purposeful sharing of comparative research around the world. The College of Education, Health, and Society is focused, focusing on a holistic, integrated approach, the Imagination Immersion Program, to develop and use creative approaches to respond to real-world problems that the EHS community can solve using their resources and working collaboratively. Through the College of Engineering and Computing, Miami is one of 122 universities that recently signed a letter committing them to <coughs> contributing us to, con to contribute in every way possible to the 14 engineering grand challenges that were identified nationally. These examples demonstrate the power of interdisciplinary teams to pursue especially innovative opportunities. How can we better coordinate and support these activities? How can we both better support the individual scholar, creator, as well as foster the opportunities for groups to form around significant issues and themes? Is this an instance where our ability to construct virtual communities could lead to more innovation? Finally, how can we consciously organize ourselves around challenges as the examples of EHS and engineering demonstrate? How can we use these challenges to deepen our sense of purpose and mission by bringing to bear our collective research efforts to address critical issues that affect the future of the globe. Such academic initiatives have been complemented by our extraordinary success in developing and adopting lean management initiatives that improve processes and created new resources for university priorities. While these efforts have been overwhelmingly in the service functions of the university, many are emerging in the academic sphere as well. More than 2,000 individuals, including myself, have had some level of lean training. More than 650 projects have been completed, and the total financial impact has been nearly $30 million, with much of that impact ongoing, thus allowing us to invest critical resources in priority areas such as salaries and scholarships. As significant as the financial impact has been, perhaps the largest impact, certainly with respect to our goal to be a more creative and innovative university, are the impacts that the impacts these efforts have had to improve the quality and effectiveness of a wide variety of university activities and in stimulating more innovative thinking among our community. Let me give you an example. This example comes from EHS and is a description of the process that previously was involved in a student changing their major. This is what was diagrammed. Now, you don't need to worry about the detail of it, but the pink areas are steps or actions that are taken that do not add value to the process. The blue ones are steps that do. The whole effort is about identifying how we can do better. The end result of this particular lean team was a new process that looks like this. So we have gone from this to this. Pretty impressive. That's what we mean by improving the outcomes as we move forward. Lean has also been used to uh, increase revenue streams and to push for green initiatives. Clearly, this program has produced great results and been a huge source of encouragement for innovative thinking. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the term lean suggests a simple reducing of resources, which is not what drives lean. I hope, therefore, that we can find a better name to describe the program, a name that will focus on the value and opportunities, such as these. It has given us to use creativity and innovation to use our time and energy more wisely, 
to eliminate unnecessary actions that frustrate us all, to create new and more effective structures and activities, and, to, and above all, to generate better outcomes. So in addition to institutional support, the commitment to continuous improvement needs to be grounded in the attitudes of individuals, in each of us. In addition to a sense of purpose, Daniel Pink has identi identified two other qualities that innovative institutions encourage in individuals. Autonomy, the sense of acting with choice, and mastery, the desire to get better. Pink argues that autonomy is critical for individuals to see possibilities around them and to act on those ideas. There is nothing so frustrating to all of us as having what we think is a good idea, especially about how we approach our work, than to have that idea dismissed or ignored rather than being seriously considered. As we move forward, it is important for all of us, but especially those of us in supervisory positions, to be aware of the importance of a sense of autonomy in encouraging innovative thinking and a greater sense of self-worth. One powerful way to enhance autonomy is to work together, to collaborate, to advance knowledge and solve problems. The reverse of this cooperation is the chilling effect that silos in an organization have on creativity and innovation. We all recognize the insidious impact of turf protection, basically attempts to maintain the status quo from either an organizational or individual point of view. Well, too much change too quickly can be very disruptive. Innovation virtually requires us to consider change that may be uncomfortable. To do so, though, requires a high degree of trust in others and in the organization that fruitful collaborations engender. The desire to improve or mastery is very much a core value of an institution devoted to learning and discovery. As noted earlier, it really is part of our DNA. Thus, we have continued to improve how we can encourage and support individuals, advancing their skills and capabilities. It, is per, it perhaps starts with how we approach our annual reviews. In the last few years, we have been moving from a dominating focus on performance evaluation, though that obviously remains important, to a focus on personal and professional development. This emphasis is codified in Miami 2020 with one of our metrics that calls for all employees to have a measurable professional plan. The good news, according to Pink then, is that we have the right idea. Now our challenge is to put that idea into practice at a very high level so that we encourage and support the individual desire to improve. We can make a similar assessment about our commitment to the development of leadership. This is an important institutional priority for both faculty and staff. Developing leaders provides great opportunities for individuals and it assures, it assures the university that we will have a continual, a continual well of strong leadership at all levels. In addition to the many programs for developing specific leadership skills, I would like to highlight the Institute for Miami Leadership Development that brings together 10 to 12 uh, mid-career faculty and staff each year who desire to increase their leadership capabilities. This creative and hugely impactful program was launched by now Dean Michael Dantley while he was in the provost's office. I urge us to consider additional ways that we can build on the successes of all these programs to enhance leadership across the university and in turn stimulate more innovation, more innovation and creativity. I would like to end my remarks today with both a thank you and an encouragement. First, the thank you. Last year we appointed a creative group of 20 people from across our campuses to serve as a steering committee for this year of creativity and innovation. We had high expectations, but this group has exceeded all of them. I particularly want to single out and thank Glenn Platt and Peg Feynman for their leadership on this and for their never-ending enthusiasm in ask, answering my questions. I think it is fair to say that this is turning, to be out, to, turning out to be the most creative steering group we have ever had. Their work encouraged more than 100 people around Miami to volunteer as creative coaches and creative cohorts. So I hope you will visit the website and plug into the many events and activities that are highlighted there. And if in doubt, send a note to Glenn or Peg and they'll take it from there and good things will happen. Second, the encouragement. As I noted at the outset of my remarks, our goals for this year of creativity and innovation are to build our long-term capacity to produce more creative and innovative graduates 
and to be a more creative and innovative university. As I have tried to stress throughout my remarks, we are already well on our way on this trajectory and are known, in fact, nationally for the innovative quality of our academic programs and operations. I have argued that the key to becoming even better is to strengthen those qualities that result in more creative individuals and a more creative institution. Let me repeat, to strengthen those qualities that result in more creative individuals and a more creative university. Significantly, most of these qualities, like curiosity, knowledge, and purpose, either align with or emanate from our liberal arts foundation. So in the final analysis, this year is about acting with even more intention to strengthen a culture that is grounded in that foundation. I have no doubt that as we do so, we will contribute not only to creativity and innovation, but also to the very heart of the academic enterprise, our liberal foundations, and the success of our students. That we will have promoted a vibrant learning and discovery environment that produces extraordinary student and scholarly outcomes. So my encouragement is to take time this year to learn more about creativity and innovation, to participate in the activities that Miami Ideas has provided, to have some fun with them, and to explore how they can enhance our personal and professional lives and every aspect of the life of Miami University. For love and honor, thank you. Thank you all for coming.